glory days of NASA are over. Today, the military-industrial complex is marching towards world dominance through space technology on behalf of the global corporate interests. To find out how and why the space program will be used to fight all future wars on Earth and from space, it's important to go back in time to understand how the public has been misled about the origins and true purpose of the space program. If we really want to understand what's going on in space today and what's happening with the plan to put weapons in space, I think it's instructive to go back and understand the origins of the U.S. space program. And to do that, you have to go back to Nazi Germany. Hitler recruited a brilliant young rocket scientist by the name of Werner von Braun, who had a weekend rocket club, to come to work for the Nazis to build the V-1 and V-2 rockets that were used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels towards the end of World War II. And for von Braun and his team, uh, they set up along the Baltic Sea a place called Pinamunde. It was a research and development center for the Nazi rocket uh, operation. And to this place at Pinamunde, the Nazis brought thousands of Jews and French resistance fighters to serve as prisoners, essentially slaves, to build this production effort. Well, the British found out about it, went in and bombed the entire operation. And so the Nazis said, we've got to move to a more secure location. And down inside of central Germany, there's a mountain chain called the Hartz Mountains. And in that mountain, there's a huge tunnel where the Nazis were storing military hardware. Well, they cleared the whole thing out, moved the entire rocket operation into the tunnel, named it Middlework. And just outside the mountain tunnel at Middlework, the Nazis built a brand new concentration camp called Dora. And to Dora, the Nazis brought 40,000 Jews, gypsies, French resistance fighters, homosexuals, communists, even a black American GI were brought there to serve as slaves for the operation. Well, inside the mountain tunnel, the slaves began to sabotage the operation. They left screws unturned. They urinated on the wires. So that when von Braun and his team were launching the rockets, they were going haywire. And so they sent their team in to find out who was doing this. They identified 100 of the slaves and summarily hung them in front of everyone as a warning that you will not interfere with this operation. Well, eventually the Allies even closed in on this place too. And on the day that they did, von Braun and his team fled for the hills, knowing that if they were captured here, they would be accused of crimes against humanity. One of the first to arrive at this place was an 18-year-old American GI by the name of Hugh Carey, who later became governor of New York State. And he said when they arrived, what they discovered, lying at their feet, was thousands and thousands and thousands of dead bodies. And come to find out, 25,000 of the 40,000 slaves at this place perished at the hands of the Nazis. Well, you know, immediately after the war, the U.S. and the Allies created the Nuremberg Trials, at which time we brought the Nazis to justice for their crimes against humanity. But 1,500 of the top Nazis never went to trial. They were smuggled into the United States by the U.S. military in, uh, under a program called Operation Paperclip, smuggled in through Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. And Werner von Braun and his rocket team, a hundred of them, along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket, were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, where von Braun became the first director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's interesting is the other 1,400 Nazis, who were they? Well, some of them were brought to the United States to work for the CIA. Others were brought to the United States to do the LSD drug experiments and the MK Ultra Mind experiments during the 1960s where people were jump jumping out of windows. Some of the uh, Nazi scientists that in Germany had been taking Jews and putting them in freezing temperatures to see how the body would react to that were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and were put in charge of the 
U.S. military flight medicine program. And so when you uh, take 1,500 of the top Nazi scientists and essentially seed the military industrial complex, the question I have is, do they bring with them an ideological contamination? Well, not only did von Braun go to work for NASA, but the guy that was in charge of the V-2 flight test program up at Pinamundi along the Baltic Sea, a guy by the name of Kurt Debus, became the first director of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And then the man that recruited von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger, the guy that was sent by uh, Hitler to recruit von Braun to come to work for the Nazis, he became vice president of Bell Aerosystems Corporation in New York that made its riches building the helicopters for the war in Vietnam. In fact, when NASA was created, the US military freaked out. You're going to have a civilian space program? You can't do that. The military has to be in charge of space. Oh, don't worry, don't worry, the military was told. From the first day, we're going to have a NASA oversight committee that ensures that the Pentagon controls the space program. And Major General Walter Dornberger, the Nazi that recruited von Braun, was appointed to that NASA oversight committee. In fact, in 1958, Dornberger testified before the United States Congress, saying that America's top space priority should be to, quote, conquer, occupy, keep, and utilize space between the Earth and the Moon. And in fact, Later on, in a speech before a National Missile Industry Conference, Dornberger told the assembled, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And then finally, the man that was in charge of production at Middlework, inside the mountain tunnel there in Germany, Arthur Rudolph, he became the first project director of the NASA Saturn V rocket program that took the United States to the moon. And so these are the essential origins of the US space program. And so when we hear this slogan, master of space, that is on the building of the US Space Command headquarters in Colorado Springs at Peterson Air Force Base, do we not find an ideological similarity between master of space and Hitler's slogan, Deutschland über alles, Germany overall. Well, what were the major implications of the Space Act? They simply said that we were to uh, pursue uh, the development of activities in space for the benefit of all mankind. Well, let's take a look at this U.S. Space Command. What is it? It's the command that has been put in charge of controlling space. And it has just recently been merged with the old Strategic Air Command. So now that the, the space guys, if you will, and the old bomber guys and the missile guys are all part of the same command. And the Space Command put out a planning document a few years ago called Vision for 2020. And on the cover of it, you see a satellite hitting targets on the Earth below. Let's take a look at some of the language in this so-called vision for 2020. The Space Command says that in the future, because of corporate globalization of the world economy, they expect that there's going to be a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots, between the rich and the poor all over the world. And as a result of that, the Pentagon predicts that there's going to be more and more regional instability around the world. because people that are under the boot of these multinational corporations are going to organize. They're going to try to organize unions. They're going to organize to get the, these corporations from controlling their governments. And the Pentagon says, you know, we can't put a Marine on every single street corner of the world to suppress these populations. But with space technology in place, we'll be able to see everything, hear everything, and essentially target everything in every place on the Earth. And the Vision 2020 says that space superiority will emerge as an essential element of battlefield success in future warfare. Vision for 2020 also talks about 
dominating space and controlling space. And they actually define control of space. They say control of space is the ability to assure access to space, freedom of operations within the space medium. And I think, most importantly of all, they say, an ability to deny others the use of space. So here we are, 5% of the world's population. We're going to deny other countries the use of space because we are going to be the masters of space. If you take a look at the Space Command website and you take a look at the plans they have, it's mind-boggling. I mean, they are trying to put in motion plans which, in effect, could allow some uh, command post in Colorado Springs, you know, Colorado Mountains, to instantaneously uh, attack any part of the world without warning from space platforms with uh, either nuclear or other high destruct destructive weapons. Uh, and uh, to, it's a chance, they think, to cut back on forward basing and uh, simply to hold the her whole world in thrall to instant destruction with, you know, Mach 10 um, hypersonic drones uh, giving instant surveillance of whether somebody's crossing a street in some Australia or something like that. Well, we now know that the Persian Gulf War in the early 90s was actually the first space war ever. With U.S. satellite supremacy, we were able to pre-identify all of Saddam Hussein's military targets before the war ever began. And in the first two to three days of that war, we bombed over 90% of Saddam Hussein's targets, intentionally leaving just a tiny sliver of capability in place that we then played cat and mouse with over the remaining weeks of the war, where we used 100 cruise missiles at a million dollars apiece, tested out new stealth bombers and new laser weapons. And so coming out of that war, the Space Command said, my God, whoever controls space is going to control the Earth below. Whoever controls the uh, space will win all the wars on the Earth. And so we now know that the Kosovo War, the war with Yugoslavia, was actually the second space war. And the war with Afghanistan was the third space war. And in that war with Afghanistan, the United States introduced a whole new weapon system called the UAV, the Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, a pilotless plane that flies over Afghanistan, sending back what is called real-time, split-second time streaming video via satellite back to MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, where General Tommy Franks was sitting, watching the television screen. Is it Taliban? Is it Al-Qaeda? Is it a wedding? And in a moment, he could push the button and the UAV, the unmanned aerial vehicle, which the Pentagon has nicknamed the Predator, could fire in real time, could fire and hit the target on the Earth below. All done in split second by satellite technology. And so the Pentagon calls this increasing the kill chain. And in George Bush's new war with Iraq, the latest space war, the Pentagon has tested out a whole new military doctrine called shock and awe. So today, with the United States controlling space, we are able to uh, absolutely win every war on the Earth below. There is no challenger on this Earth able to stand against us. At the same time, the Bush administration is introducing this program called National Missile Defense. The idea of having a bullet hit a bullet in deep space in order to protect the continental United States from attack by the so-called rogue states. Well, I would submit to you that this idea of national missile defense is really a Trojan horse, that it has nothing to do at all with defense, but in fact it's about controlling space, dominating space, and denying other countries access to space so that the United States can be the master of space and the master of the earth below, that we can control the battlefields of the earth. And it's not beyond realization. I mean, the U.S. is, uh, there's nobody else, there's, there's no space race. The U.S. is in it alone. You know, there are no other countries willing to put the uh, uh, huge amount of uh, 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 money into efforts to uh, dominate by extreme violence. Uh, 
at the cost of lots of well, social costs, as we know. The American people are being asked to turn over the national treasury to the Pentagon because so-called missile defense will literally cost us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And how will we pay for this? Through cuts in education, health care, job programs, environmental cleanup. This is the way the Bush administration and their allies, their corporate allies, their aerospace allies, who view space as a new market, this is how they intend to pay for these programs. But besides this idea of national missile defense, that they say will protect us from attack by the rogue states, and from even China, China who today only has 20 nuclear missiles capable of hitting the United States. Besides national missile defense, though, there's a whole new program underway, and it's called theater missile defense, TMD. And the idea of theater missile defense is you don't wait until the missiles get way up into deep space. You forward deploy your systems and surround this so-called offending rogue state and try to hit their missiles immediately after they're launched in what's known as its boost phase. And so today, the United States is moving to deploy theater missile defense in the Middle East and in the Asian Pacific region. We're going to put theater missile defense on Navy ships, Aegis destroyers that are made at Bath Iron Works in the state of Maine. And on these Aegis destroyers, they will be outfitted with interceptor missiles that will be deployed throughout the Asian Pacific region. In addition to the Aegis destroyers, the United States will also deploy theater missile defense on trucks, ground-based launchers, and also on the airborne laser, a converted Boeing 747 with a laser beam on its nose, flying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, over this so-called offending area. Now, when I started thinking about this, China has 20 nuclear missiles capable of hitting the United States. If you've been to Walmart or Kmart anytime recently, you know we're China's very best customer. Is China going to attack its best customer, knowing that we have 7,500 of our own nuclear weapons that we could hit them back with? It just doesn't make sense. But then I found an article in the Washington Post a while back called, For the Pentagon, Asia Moving to the Forefront. And the article says that we are going to manage China. The United States is going to manage China. The article says that we're going to double our military presence in the Asian Pacific region. In fact, we are now lengthening and widening the runways on Guam and Wake Island in the Pacific to handle the B-2 bombers and also we're now pre-positioning cruise missiles on Guam. And we're going to deploy theater missile defense systems in Japan, what we now call our unsinkable aircraft carrier, where today we have 40,000 US troops deployed. And right next door to Japan and South Korea, where we have 40,000 US troops deployed, and where Bush is now heating up tensions between the United States and North Korea, we're going to deploy theater missile defense in South Korea, which will only anger the North Korean government even more, making them feel like we are closing in on them and that they must respond by escalating their own military hardware. We're going to deploy theater missile defense 90 miles off the coast of mainland China in Taiwan which will make China feel like they've got to respond and they've got to go now and build more nuclear missiles to meet this growing threat. You know, after 9-11, I began to look at this whole map of this Asian Pacific region a lot differently. Previously, I was just looking at the coastal region along China's coast where the United States is talking about deploying these theater missile defense systems. But after 9-11, I now look at China's inland border, an area that we now call Central Asia. We know a lot more about it today. We know that the United States has set up bases now in this Central Asian region. And that, as President Bush has said, we're going to be there a long, long time. And so today we've set up bases in Afghanistan, in Uzbekistan, in 
Tajikistan and throughout this region and come to find out we now know that this Central Asian region has some of the largest deposits of oil and natural gas in the entire world. Uzbekistan has the largest gold mine in the entire world. So clearly, this response from 9-11 to go to war with Afghanistan and to take over Afghanistan, I would submit to you, is part of a larger geopolitical strategy now underway. What gives me confidence in saying that is that I recently read a book by a former national security advisor to the Carter administration, a guy by the name of Zbigniew Brzezinski. And the book is called The Grand Chessboard. And in that book, Brzezinski has two very important graphs. One of those graphs shows oil pipelines coming through Afghanistan, taking the oil into the, to, uh, ports in the Arabian Sea, where US oil corporations could then move it to Asian Pacific markets that are expanding now and demanding more oil. In fact, we found out that in 1997, the Unical Corporation, one of their vice presidents, testified before the Congress of the United States, imploring Congress to help put a, a more compliant government into Afghanistan so that Unical could then get agreements to build the oil pipelines through that region. And so in Brzezinski's book then, he lays out what he calls two key collision points. That if the United States is going to control the oil and control the markets in this emerging Asian Pacific region, the one collision point is the coastal region along China, where today we're moving to uh, deploy theater missile defense systems. And the other collision point is in the Central Asian region, where today we're setting up bases since 9-11 to supposedly go after terrorists. In the Space Command's other planning document of importance called the Long Range Plan, they lay out their final vision control not only of the Middle East or the Asian Pacific, but control of literally the entire Earth. With the new technologies underway, the successor to the shuttle that is being worked on today, for example, what they're calling the military space plane, that would fly down from orbit, drop an attack on the Earth, and then go back up into space. And also the space-based laser, what they're calling the Death Star at the Pentagon. The industry magazine Aviation Week and Space Technology recently reported on a Space Command computer war game set in the year 2017. And in that computer war game, it was the US against China, the Reds versus the Blues. And in that computer war game, the Space Command launched a preemptive first strike attack on China. Now, Maybe a year or two ago, we would have all laughed at the notion of the United States launching a preemptive first strike attack on anyone. But now we all know that in the George W. Bush administration, preemptive first strike attack is now official doctrine. And so in that computer war game, the United States launched a preemptive first strike attack on China, using as its first weapon the successor to the shuttle, the military space plane that flew down from orbit, dropped an attack on China, and then went back up into orbit again. And then the second attack in that computer war game was none other than the space-based laser. A few years ago, the Congress of the United States asked a congressional staffer by the name of John Collins to write the definitive study, how's this whole thing going to work? And his report to the Congress is a book called Military Space Forces, The Next 50 Years. The interesting thing about the book is that in the foreword of it, the section where people recommend it, it is signed by the likes of Senator John Glenn, former congressman, now senator from Florida, Bill Nelson, and other leading politicians. And one of the most interesting things in this book is that the author says, whoever controls the Earth-Moon gravity well will control who gets on and off the planet Earth. He says with US bases on the moon and with armed space stations at the L4 and L5 positions, the United States will be able to essentially control who gets on and off 
the planet Earth. Now, why would the United States want to control who got on and off the planet Earth? To understand that, we, we must understand what's really behind the space exploration program of NASA. In another book, written by a NASA scientist this time, called Mining the Sky, Untold Riches from the Asteroids, Comets, and Planets, John Lewis reports that there is gold on the asteroids. There's magnesium and cobalt and uranium on Mars, and there's helium-3 in water on the moon. And he says whoever gets to these planetary bodies and controls them is going to be rich beyond anything ever known. And so today, the Mars missions that we're now seeing are really about identifying the soil on the planet, taking samples, and someday in the future, NASA predicts, around 2020 or 2025, they expect to have human mining colonies actually powered with nuclear reactors on the planet of Mars. And NASA has said that when the day comes when the corporations, the aerospace industry, can actually turn profit mining the sky. They're going to privatize the entire operation so that after you, the taxpayers, would have paid all the years of research and development, when the time came to make money, they're going to privatize. And in fact, there's a bill pending in Congress that would make all profits in space tax exempt. But there is one problem. It takes a year to get to Mars. They say so long that an astronaut's body would turn to jello because of space radiation. And so NASA has been looking, away, looking at ways to get to Mars quicker. And the Bush administration has come up with a new program called the Nuclear Systems Initiative, a $3 billion research and development program to create a whole slew of nuclear projects for the future, including Project Prometheus, a nuclear rocket with nuclear reactors for engines to cut in half the amount of time it takes to get to Mars. And so what we are now witnessing is that NASA and the Department of Energy and the Pentagon are working together to move nuclear power into space. Returning to the book uh, Military Space Forces for a moment, in that book, the author tells Congress that fundamentally none of these plans for space will work without nuclear power. He says, nuclear reactors thus remain the only known long-lived compact source able to supply military space forces with the kind of multi-megawatt power they're going to need. Larger versions, he says, of these nuclear reactors could provide power for things like space-based lasers, neutral particle beams, mass drivers, and rail guns. Nuclear reactors, he says, must support major bases on the moon until better options yet identified are found. And I think very interestingly, he says this, safety factors rather than technological feasibility will remain the principal impediment to nuclear power in space unless officials can convince influential critics that risks are acceptably low. In 1989, I organized a demonstration at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, one of many that I've done over the years. What made our demonstration that day particularly important, though, was our keynote speaker, former Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell, one of the early moonwalkers. And in that demonstration, Mitchell said that we cannot allow the Pentagon to put weapons in space. In fact, he said we can't even let them test weapons in space, because even the testing process will create so much more space junk orbiting debris in space that we will not be able to get a rocket off the planet Earth, because we will create essentially a minefield surrounding the planet and that we will be entombed to the Earth below. If we have a war in space in the vicinity of the Earth, it will be the one and only. There will never be a second war in space, and let me tell you why. It only takes a simple calculation to determine this, and all aerospace engineers know what it is. It's been studied many times. You do not need but a few million pounds of matter in space, broken up into tiny pellets, 
one gram size to make the near regions of space totally uninhabitable from the debris. Space is the most environmentally sensitive area we have around Earth. On the oceans, a beer can can sink to the bottom, be covered over with silt, and in a few generations will return to the Earth. It'll disintegrate. A piece of space junk, if it's in an orbit that doesn't intersect the atmosphere, will stay there forever. There is no way to clean it up. We explode a few pieces of equipment up there. Eight million pounds, that is the size of one Saturn Apollo launch vehicle, what I went to the moon on. You break up eight million pounds into one gram mass and just let it distribute throughout the first thousand kilometers of space and no spacecraft can survive in space more than a few days. Future generations will be precluded from using space at all. And being able to get out to deep space, it will be like swimming through a piranha-filled river or running through a hail of bullets to get into outer space. It doesn't seem sensible to me that in the first hundred years of using that environment, presumably for our betterment, we take decisions and commit acts that preclude all future generations from a proper use of that environment. Come to find out today, there are over 110,000 pieces of space junk orbiting the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour. So many that they recently had to move the International Space Station to another orbit to get out of the way of the coming space junk. The space station that originally was going to cost taxpayers $10 billion and now uh, today is now costing us $100 billion. Could have been smashed to bits by this space junk. But also we know today that there are 34 nuclear reactor cores orbiting the Earth below. Launched there by the United States and the former Soviet Union all the way back to the early 60s when the space program began. These nuclear reactor cores are powering military satellites orbiting the planet. But several of them have fallen back to Earth, including a terrible accident in 1964 of a US military satellite with two pounds of plutonium on board. It was called SNAP-9A. It burned up on reentry, spreading the plutonium globally to be ingested by the people of the Earth into our lungs and to be passed on through our reproductive organs for generations after generations to come. One of the founders of uranium, Dr. John Goffman at Lawrence Livermore Labs in California, studied that particular accident and believes it's one of the major contributors to the increased cancers around the Earth today. And now the Bush administration is contemplating a dramatic escalation of the launching of nuclear materials into space. Mars missions with little rovers driving around, powered by plutonium-238. Nuclear rockets and nuclear-powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars and other planetary bodies. And what about the laboratories at the Department of Energy labs across the country as they're fabricating these plutonium devices? Will we see a growing uh, contamination at these laboratories and, and amongst the workers? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, in 1997, when Cassini was launched, and our organization organized a global campaign against the launching of 72 pounds of plutonium-238 on board the Cassini space flight, we found out that between 94 and 96, at Lawrence Livermore Labs in New Mexico, there were 244 cases of worker contamination reported as they were fabricating the generators for the Cassini mission. So it's not just some theoretical possibility that there might be an accident on launch that could cause contamination. The sheer processing and fabrication of these uh, space devices is killing people already. But if we learned anything from the Challenger and Columbia shuttle accidents, it's that space technology can and does fail. And as we all witnessed on television, that wide debris field as the Columbia burned up on reentry. This should be a warning to us that launching nuclear power in space 
could contaminate massive, massive parts of this country or another country on this earth. The chances of something going wrong just by accident are quite high. Uh, I mean, these are complicated computerized systems. Uh, others aren't going to just sit around. Uh, so, for example, space, uh, space uh, mil uh, uh, offensive weaponry from space, which is being planned, uh, requires uh, satellites. Uh, space rather heavily on satellite communication. Well, you know, shooting down satellites isn't very hard. It's a lot easier than stopping missiles. I mean, you know where the satellite is, you know where it's going, and so on. So uh, anti-satellite weapons are kind of a poor man's weapon. And there's very little doubt that potential targets like China uh, will be developing uh, technology. We're asking them virtually to develop technology to destroy our satellite system. So far that's been immune because of the observance of the space treaty. And uh, then there's going to be other reactions. I mean, they're going to increase their development of weapons of mass destruction as a deterrent, uh, probably increase terror as a deterrent, because there aren't a lot of alternatives. And uh, once you get up to, uh, uh, the Russians are already r responding with, uh, under U.S. pressure, incidentally, uh, to move uh, nuclear, to expand radically their uh, nucle offensive nuclear weapon system to uh, put it on launch on warning, which is extremely dangerous. They're, they're deteriorating economy during the so-called reforms, uh, the computerized systems are falling apart. Uh, we've come very close to accidental nuclear war, and this substantially increases the risk, and sooner or later it'll happen, uh, just uh, by what's called in the trade uh, normal accidents, uh, meaning the kind of accident that y you know is going to take place in any complex system, but you don't know when. You know, so any say a computer or any, these are way more complex systems, but something's going to go wrong because it always does. And if it happens to go wrong, you know, say goodbye to each other. In the environmental impact statement for the Cassini mission carrying 72 pounds of plutonium, NASA admitted that if there was a launch explosion and there was a release of the plutonium, that the winds would carry it for about a 60 mile radius all the way from the Space Center out to Orlando on the west, north to Daytona Beach, and south to Vero Beach, Florida. A 60 mile contamination belt, if you will. And NASA said that they would have to go in and remove all the people. Then they would have to go in and remove all the buildings. Then they'd have to go in and remove all the animals. Can you imagine how they would do that? The fish, the birds, the snakes, the alligators. Then they would have to remove all the vegetation and ultimately remove the top half inch of soil because everything would be radioactively contaminated for thousands of years. They would have essentially created a nuclear wasteland. A couple of years ago, uh, NASA had a launch accident at the Cape, the Delta rocket. The, the um, toxic material from that was in my community within an hour or so, and no one knew what was happening, only that there was breathing problems in the air. When I called emergency management in my local county office, there was no information. That emergency management office had no information about what was on that rocket, whether there was nuclear material released, and there was absolutely no time, for, there was no warning, no one had any time, and people were getting respiratory problems from this cloud that was hovering over our town. Uh, they have absolutely no plans to protect us from any kind of nuclear explosion at the Cape, and I'm very, very concerned for my community. And so that's why this nuclear systems initiative of the Bush administration is so dangerous, because they're now contemplating a dramatic expansion, a dramatic escalation of the numbers of launches. It's like playing Russian roulette putting a bullet in the chamber and pulling the trigger, eventually one of them is going to go off. I mean, the militarization of space is a real threat to survival, serious threat to survival. That's why the whole world is uh, strongly against it. I mean, ever since uh, there is a 1967 uh, Outer Space Treaty, which 
uh, limits the use of space, it tries to limit the use of space to uh, peaceful purposes. And the last few years, it has been understood around the world that the United States is going to violate it. Uh, so there are effort, there have been efforts at the United Nations, at the UN Disarmament Commission, uh, and elsewhere to uh, try to put some teeth in the Outer Space Treaty, make it uh, put enforcement mechanisms which will prevent the militarization of space, and the U.S. has just been blocking them. Well, after Cassini was launched, it went out uh, around Venus and whipped around Venus and then came hurtling back to Earth. And it was going to do what's called an Earth flyby, use the gravity of Earth to sling it on out into deep space. Originally, they were going to come in at about 125 miles off the surface of the Earth. And the fear was that the Earth's gravity could pull it in. And if there was a misfire of its rockets, which in the laboratory had a 10% failure rate, by the way, uh, it could have then burned up on reentry, spread 72 pounds of plutonium globally. It only takes one pound of plutonium to essentially give everybody on the Earth a lethal, a lethal dose. But anyway, uh, because of our protests prior to the launch, NASA moved it out 250 miles. And then prior to the slingshot that came around in 1999, they moved it out to about 500 miles. So that as it did its maneuver, its flyby maneuver of the Earth, there was a lot less likely chance that it was going to uh, fall into the Earth's uh, gravity and be sucked in. This was a major victory for us, actually. Not very well reported in the media, but we forced NASA to move Cassini hundreds of miles farther from the Earth as they did that flyby. Fortunately, the Cassini flyby went without any problem, and it's now going out into deep space on its mission. NASA says that they have to use nuclear power on these interplanetary probes because they're going too far from the sun that solar won't work in deep space, and so therefore they have no other choice but to use nuclear power. But it's interesting because the European Space Agency is doing a mission called Rosetta that is going way out into deep, dark space, and they're using solar power. They've developed high-efficiency solar cells for deep space missions because de they don't rely on nuclear power. They don't have a nuclear industry that is controlling the planning process within the European Space Agency. In the last 10 years, NASA's budget has been cut by about 40%. And this has turned NASA to go to the Pentagon, whose budget has been growing all the time. Uh, NASA now is saying to the Pentagon, OK, everything we do from now on will be dual use, meaning every mission we do will be carrying military and civilian payloads. We know that the Columbia, the recent Columbia shuttle accident, had on board three military missions. We were told by the media that they were just studying bugs and moss on board. But in fact, they had three military missions, including Star Wars and planning missions. And so again, the uh, weapons corporations have taken over the space program. And they're hiding behind it, using it in order to go out and create these new testing programs for Star Wars because they don't want the American people to understand the depth of the plans for moving the arms race into the heavens. I call it pyramids to the heavens. The aerospace corporations are the new pharaohs of our age, building these pyramids to the heavens. And we, the taxpayers, will be the slaves. We'll turn over our education We'll turn over our health care. We'll turn over our children's future and get very little in return, just like the slaves at the time of the pharaohs. You know, we know there are so many plans that are underway now for space technologies that are secret. There's a whole thing called the black budget, where even the Congress of the United States doesn't even know about these secret programs underway. So we're just scratching the surface here with what we understand. But clearly, what we understand is frightening. And what we don't know should be even more frightening to us. And in the end, we're told all of this is being done in order to make our lives more secure. But the truth of the matter is, our lives are becoming more insecure because of all these programs and plans. 
We're making the world more unstable. We're creating more enemies around the world. We're creating new arms races. We're draining the treasury, taking money out of protecting our children's future. All of this is going to make our lives more insecure. We know that the Bush administration and their corporate allies are going to do everything they can to restrict civil liberties as opposition builds to their plans for this corporate domination. We saw in New York City when there was big demonstrations there recently that the police wouldn't allow the uh, people to even have a march permit. And they began, as people arrived, to just attend a rally. They tried to push them away, not allowing them even to come to that. We're seeing more and more of these intrusions into our civil liberties around the country. And so I think this is going to be uh, something that uh, we're going to see more of. Well, just as the corporations have taken control of our government, they've also taken control of the media. The media is now dominated by just literally a handful of multinational corporations. For example, the Chicago Tribune brags that on a given day, 80% of the American people get their information from a Chicago Tribune product, whether it's television, newspaper, internet, radio. And in fact, Secretary of War Donald Rumsfeld was on the board of directors of the Chicago Tribune before Bush appointed him to his, to his current post. So what we have now is these interlocking boards of directorates, the weapons corporations, the pharmaceutical corporations, the banking corporations, the nuclear energy corporations, and the media corporations. It's all the same people. And that's who we're dealing with here in the world today. You know, the United States justifies our war in Afghanistan and then the war in Iraq as a response to the terrorists. But what we have done is we have become a terrorist nation just as the terrorists themselves have done. We must acknowledge that today our Congress is essentially under the control of the multinational corporations. You know, when former President Eisenhower, a World War II general, left office in January of 1961, in his concluding speech to the American people, he warned us to beware of the power of the military-industrial complex. He said they were gaining undue influence in the halls of the Congress. And I'm afraid General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower's warning to us has come true. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Keith Glennon recalls President Eisenhower's feelings about space. He was not a space cadet, he used to say, as he looked over at his shoulder and he said, you know, Keith, that moon's been there a long time. It's going to be there a great many eons yet. And we'll get there one day, but it isn't necessary we break our necks and break the budget to get there now. Our Congress has been taken over by the big money and by the weapons industry who want to use our government to further their product, if you will. And their product is war and death and chaos and control and domination around the world. So what can we do? What can the citizens of this country do in the face of this mass undertaking? Well, I think first of all, that we have to uh, recognize that we shouldn't have any illusions any longer about our country. We've got to recognize the reality of our times. Each of us individually, we have to accept the fact that our democracy is now under control of these big corporations, this new world order, if you will. And from there, we have to go and educate ourselves more about what is happening 
in this world and to take that to our families and to our neighbors and to our schools and to our communities and share that with others because we do have the media under the control of these corporations and so we can't expect the media is going to do this job for us it's our job now to become the media if you will the the u.n disarmament commission was meeting from uh, during the clinton years this is a session started i think january 2001 around then and uh, for a long time its main issue was efforts by most of the rest of the world to try to get uh, uh, militarization of space on the table, on the negotiating table, and the U.S. simply blocked it. And for a long, I, a friend of mine did a database search on it. Uh, it was reported abroad, but the only report in the United States that was listed on, you know, standard databases was uh, one small newspaper in Utah reported it. It was all on the wire services, and everyone, every editorial office had it on their desk. Uh, but you just don't report that the U.S. is blocking global efforts to save the species by preventing militarization of space. It's an extremely dangerous thing. And just as George W. Bush has essentially declared war on the world, I believe he and his friends in this country, and the Republican Party, the conservatives, have declared war on America as well. What we see now is an effort to essentially get rid of government's role in the lives of the people of this country, get rid of education funding, get rid of health care, impose a very mean-spirited uh, justice system upon us, and essentially say the only role of government is to uh, create a military, that the government has no role in the human needs area at all. You know, I think the most interesting thing uh, for us is to answer this question. What is the number one industrial export of America today? Of course, the answer is weapons. I like to say if it was shoes, we'd have a global marketing strategy. We're going to put a shoe on every person's foot of the world. But when weapons are your number one industrial export, what is your global marketing strategy? Of course, the answer is chaos madness, instability. The more there is, the more weapons you sell. Let's look at the Middle East. Today, the United States is arming everyone. We brought the Shah of Iran to power and, brought, and gave him arms. Saddam Hussein was working for the CIA, and we armed him against Iran. Today, we sell weapons to Egypt, to Israel, to Bahrain, to Kuwait, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, on and on and on. And so, now, oh my God, we've got to go into that region and settle it down. We've got to take control because it's chaos, it's, it's unstable. And now I believe that the United States plan is to do the same thing in the Asian Pacific region. By putting theater missile defense into Japan, into Taiwan, into South Korea, and on ships and planes throughout the region, China will be forced to respond. North Korea, we're already seeing that they're uh, getting jacked up over this whole thing. And this will create a new arms race that will only benefit the U.S. weapons corporations. Our vision is one called a more perfect union. This vision says all for one and one for all, that we're never secure as long as anyone is insecure, as long as we have poor people sleeping on the streets at night, as long as we have elderly people without health care, as long as we have children whose education system is declining dramatically, then none of us are safe and secure. And so as we see this Bush war on the world, we are also engaged at the same time as on this, this war, if you will, for these competing interests and ideologies here in this country. We don't have to. Uh... Uh, agree to let the government spend uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a year on uh, measures which are likely to destroy uh, maybe the species. Uh, and people, of course, can't react to it if they don't know about it. Uh, but uh, here's where, uh, if a free press was functioning, it would be all over the headlines. You know, you wouldn't have to look on the Space Command uh, website to find out about it or read the small newspaper in Utah. You know. 
There's no assurance that the Bush administration and their friends are going to succeed in their efforts to control our democracy and to control the world. Right now, they're moving in that direction, but there's no guarantee they're going to succeed. Because what we're now seeing is all over the world, a global movement has, has joined together, a peace movement, a movement against corporate domination, a global movement speaking to protect the environment, a movement that is speaking to protect our civil rights all over the world, our freedoms to speak out, to petition our governments. These movements are growing day by day. So this should give us all hope, but they will only flourish if we help water them, if we become active participants in these global movements, in these global struggles. No one community, no one country can now stop what is happening. No movement in any one country. It's going to take a global movement, people working together all over the world. And I hope you will all become a part of that in each and every way that you can, and each and every day. Find something that you can do, some way that you can participate in this great struggle to serve humanity, not to serve the money, not to serve the greed, but to serve the future, the future generations. I hope you'll join with us. Thank you very much for listening.